Okay. So um, again, now um, I want to wa want to welcome Jennifer Grove, um, which I have a pleasure to know her, and I so much appreciate that you're doing this with us, Jennifer. So Jennifer Grove is the prevention director for the National Sexual uh, Violence Resource Center, which also known as NSVRC. I think most of us know NSVRC by now. Um, sometimes I actually forget the acronyms, by the way. <laughs> um, so um, Jennifer has worked in sexual violence prevention movement for over 19 years. Um, so to learn more about NSVRC and Jennifer Grove, we provided you a link, which I will send out again. And again, we want to welcome Jen. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Deanna. Can you hear me okay? Yes. And you can see my slides and everything. Okay. I am so excited to be here. Thanks so much to Deanna and Ayana and, uh, for the invitation to, to be here today. I um, use the pronouns she, her, and hers. Um, and I just want to um, just say a quick uh, bit about what we do at the NSVRC. This is a nice little slide that I like to use um, to describe a little bit about what we do as the nation's resource center on the topic of sexual violence and specifically looking at the prevention of sexual violence. We are funded um, in, in part by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and so that's what brings me here today. And um, I like to show some pictures. This picture in the upper right hand corner is a picture of um, our actual library. We have a huge library of resources um, that a lot of people don't know we have. And those include physical files and books. And that also includes um, about 40,000 titles um, in our e-files, which is uh, journal articles and lots of great stuff. So if you ever need a journal article about sexual violence prevention or sexual violence in general, come and see us because we can get those to you for free. Um, working our way around, we, we do training and technical assistance. So just what I'm doing here today on this webinar, um, we, we go around the country. We also do webinars um, and train people on sexual violence prevention um, and also how to evaluate your prevention programming and lots of other topics as well. We have a campus on our website and that campus, um, actually I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of the really awesome things on our campus today and that's really where we house a lot of the e-learning tools that we create as well as e-learning tools that other people are um, creating as well that can be useful to you. We have a commitment um, to fighting racism in everything that we do. We have a statement about this. This is something that we um, have work groups about and we really try to infuse anti-racism um, and um, anti-oppression information and resources into everything that we do. It's a commitment that we have here at the NSVRC. We also create, um, we house lots of resources, but we also look where there's gaps and we create new resources. Um, we have a blog series that we do. We have a prevention blog. We have a sexual assault awareness month blog. We have um, lots of ways that we try to connect with folks through social media. And you'll see that up there in the upper left-hand corner where if you like to do social media, if you like Pinterest, if you like LinkedIn, if you're into Facebook or Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, whatever it is, uh, we, we are there and we can connect and you can connect with us and we can connect with you on our social media. We also, um, we also plan and strategize um, and put out information about the National Sexual Assault Awareness Month campaign each year. And then last but not least, right front and center at the top in the middle is our website. We're going through a revision right now. And so our website uh, is a good uh, stopping place to go for resources and information, but it's gonna be even bigger and better in the coming months. So we're looking forward to that. I do just wanna um, say I do, I. I, this is my first time on a Zoom webinar, so I'm, I've done lots of webinars, so bear with me. I have built in some animations to my slides, and I hope that um, I can actually do this justice. So thank you for, for having patience and bearing with me. I do just want to credit my colleague and fellow prevention. Uh, we have a prevention team of two people here at NSVRC, um, and Mo Lewis is our other preventionist here. Um, they are out this week, but they are the ones who created 
the majority of these slides. And so I just want to uh, shout out to Mo for, for all of their help with that. Um, and just to let you know, we are located, we are a national center, but we are located in Pennsylvania. We're affiliated with the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Rape. Um, so I'm here in sunny Harrisburg today. Um, we're downtown Harrisburg. We also have a DC office and we also have remote staff. So Mo works from the Seattle, Washington area. We have someone in Wisconsin. We've got folks in New Hampshire. So we try to uh, spread ourselves out a little bit. So really glad to be here today. So this is one of the things that I want to make clear from the very start. It's this notion that sexual violence is a socially constructed problem and we do have the ability to deconstruct it. And I always say, you know, if we don't believe this, then we really can't be truly invested in sexual violence prevention. And so I want you to think about this image as we walk through this. Before we even walk through any of that, I really, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. That's not my plan with this, um, with this slide. This is really just to make sure that we're all on the same page by, by reviewing, for, if you can allow me just to review a few key concepts about sexual violence and its prevention. Um, so we know that sexual violence obviously is not just one behavior, but it's rather um, like a series of behaviors and attitudes or a spectrum. And that's why we like to put it in this continuum um, format and this visual. Um, everything from um, age inappropriate or non-mutual um, attitudes and behaviors like child children's behaviors that are not appropriate or children having knowledge about things they shouldn't have at a certain age to comments and jokes there's harassment, there's exploitation and coercion, and there's, there's also abuse and assault. And so these are categories or characteristics that aren't necessarily meant to be an exhaustive list of what, what we mean when we talk about that big broad term sexual violence. But I like to talk about um, the continuum as a way to really just start a conversation about the fact that there is a really wide spectrum of behaviors and sexual, sexual violence is a public, a public problem that does impact more than just individuals in a lot of different ways. So this is where primary prevention comes in. And I love to talk about primary prevention. This is probably my favorite thing to, to talk about. Um, traditionally, our prevention messages have been more about awareness and risk reduction. We're going to get a little bit more into that um, in, a, in a bit. But we've, you know, and I've been guilty of this too, you know, we've promoted messages that tell women to watch their drinks or stick with a buddy or don't walk alone at night or we put the responsibility on them to learn self-defense. It's not that those messages are necessarily um, bad, but it's important to talk to people about the larger scope of the issue. And again, if we put all of our efforts and our focus on the risk reduction piece, but we're not doing anything around how do we prevent perpetration, we're really missing a huge piece of the puzzle. And so primary prevention work really does require us to, to look at the root causes of sexual violence. And we'll go into that a little bit here soon. And those are those cultural norms that, are, that allow it to exist in the first place. And what I love about primary prevention is it really helps us to shift our focus to a more comprehensive approach to prevention. So this is, um, this is a screenshot of our primer that we're gonna go through some of the, the tabs on this today. You'll see the tabs at the top. I'm gonna be showing you portions of this. This is a really excellent online learning tool that we have on our campus. The tool is actually free to anyone. You can, um, you just have to go on our website onto the campus and set up an account, but the account is free. Um, it doesn't take very long to set it up. And then this is something that we really encourage people to take, take it yourself to test your knowledge. Um, it's kind of putting some of those concepts, the moving upstream story, the social ecological model, risk reduction and primary prevention. There's a, the, there's a quiz section. It puts a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today, and you'll see a lot of pieces of this primer today, um, but it's a nice, easy online learning tool that you yourself can use. We also encourage you to pass it on to people that you're working with in your community or your prevention groups. Use it with your prevention groups as a presentation. It actually works really well that way. Um, 
We can share it with your coworkers if you want them to know a little bit more about what you do around primary prevention and what that means. And also we have a lot of people who share it with their board members. So if you're in an organization, you're working with the board, and you're trying to get some buy-in on your prevention programming, this is a really nice tool to use for them to understand a little bit more about what primary prevention is. So again, as we said, primary prevention is stopping sexual violence before it starts. Um, so this really does, this basic definition really does align really well with the public health model, um, which the CDC is very, um, promotes very heavily. And we actually also um, uh, adhere to as well. And it really has helped shape prevention efforts in our broader movement for actually more than a decade now that we've been talking about primary prevention. Oops, sorry about that. So today we're going to explore a little bit about primary prevention in detail, and we're just going to kind of check in a little bit about your knowledge. Um, so the first question I have, and this is where you can put um, something in the text chat. So I'd love to know, to hear from you all, what, what do you think it takes to end sexual violence? So we'll just take maybe 30 seconds or so if you want to um, type in what you think it takes to end sexual violence. And we'll see, I'm checking the text chat here, so I'm, I'm waiting for you. I hope you all think, can think of something that, what does it take to end sexual violence? I know it's a really big question. Okay, so awareness of the issue, discussions around the myths and misconceptions about sexual violence, showing its relation to negative health for all involved. They're all really good. Education, collaborative effort and from everyone being open to having these conversations. Societal, so institutions and communities, and individual investment and accountability for each other. All right, well, I guess I can just really go home now because y'all are doing my presentation for me. Social disapproval of those who do it or enable it changing negative social norms. I'm loving these. Awesome. Harsher criminal laws. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to move on. These are all really good. Reporting. Okay, I got to stop reading because I'm never going to get through my, my presentation if I don't. Um, whoops. You can see my, oh, there we go. Having a little bit of a issue there. Okay, so this is an apple, obviously. Um, I actually like to talk about what it takes to prevent sexual violence by, by using an apple as sort of an example, and I'll show you why. Like, I like the apple because you can slice it up. We're going to show you some slices here. So it actually takes several different things to end sexual violence. So today we're focusing on one thing. We're focusing on primary prevention, but you'll see that there are several pieces to this apple you have, and a lot of you have talked about some of these pieces, raising awareness, reducing risk, um, there's intervention, there's services, there's treatment. And when I say intervention, services, and treatment, I'm talking about for both victims and perpetrators, because we see that as very important, uh, perpetration, prevention, and intervention and treatment is very important as well. An effective system response, so you think about the laws, the harsher criminal laws, um, social disapproval, like all of those things, reporting. And then you have this piece here, promoting healthy norms and behaviors. And guess what? That's where the, the primary prevention work is. And so all of these pieces are needed to work together to effectively address and prevent sexual violence. So here you have it. We need all the pieces working together. So that promoting healthy norms and behaviors piece is what we're gonna talk about today. And I'm just gonna give you a couple of um, very sort of high level overview of what primary prevention is, but then we also are gonna um, test your knowledge today. And um, you're gonna get to do some text chatting um, and uh, quiz, we're gonna do some quizzing on that. So what do we mean when we use, so when we think about, we wanna promote healthy norms and behaviors. Well, first of all, we need to think about what are norms. And norms are those things that, um, they're, they're behavior shapers. They're the things that, that make us kind of who we are and what we think and why we think that way. It's, it's the way of being. It's our attitudes. It's our beliefs. A lot of times, 
Um, it, you know, they're based in culture and tradition. Sometimes when I do an in-person training, we actually do a nice little like uh, shout out of like, uh, I, I always say a really good way to think about this is what are the norms in your families or in your communities? And think about those things that are really specific to your family. I know for me, in my culture, um, we have this tradition. I mean, it's just a tradition and it's part of our culture that like on Sundays, we always get together as a family. We always have a family meal. Um, it's just sort of that, that thing that we do every it's just not, it's just not, not even something we think about. It's just a part of who we are and what we do. And so again, thinking about what do we mean when we say norms, we're thinking about all of these things that really, again, shape our behavior and our attitudes and beliefs. So when we think about this in relation to sexual violence, we think about the, the norms in our society that contribute to sexual violence. So the Prevention Institute has listed five of these. Um, and the first one is power and control. So in our society, there is this expectation that there's al there always has to be one group that has power and control over another. We also have um, limited roles for women. So what roles do we have for women? A lot of times there are small, what I think of as small boxes that women and girls must fit in. And then on this, uh, um, something similar is we have these very narrow dish definitions of masculinity. So what, when you think about what does it take to be a man, you know, are you tough? don't cry, um, phrases like take it like a man, um, it, it actually does put men in kind of really narrow boxes as well in masculinity itself. There's also this, what, we, what they say, a culture of violence. It's this attitude that violence just happens. It's a normal part of life and it's a normal part of society. We look at what just happened in Las Vegas, the horrible, horrible tragedy which, you know, for many of us who do prevention work, we believe that that could have been prevented and there are lots of ways we can prevent that. However, there are some people who are, who they're interviewing who say, well, this is just what happens. We just have to accept that it's a normal part of life and it's a normal part of society. So there is that culture of just violence just happens. And then there's also our culture, um, our norms around privacy and silence. So these are things like we don't talk about those things. It's a secret. Um, or it's not my business, I'm not gonna get involved, that's a personal issue. So again, these are all norms that make, um, make it difficult in our society to, to honestly address sexual violence because these are all things that contribute to it. So these, we've got a lot of work to do. And this is, <laughs> not to depress you, but this is, a <laughs> this is a slide that Mo came up with and I really like it because um, when we talk about the social norms, the attitudes, the beliefs that sort of create this culture where sexual violence isn't just expected, it's actually normalized, um, that's what we call rape culture. And you'll see like there's a tiny little boat down there and that's, it's overwhelming. Like there, there we are, we're in the little ship, there's a tidal wave coming, tidal, tidal wave is coming. Um, and this is all the things that we um, in our, in society, in our culture have to work against. So we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means. Okay, so this is great. Oh, okay, do you mind using more? I don't know which minute you're using one that I'm in. Oh yes, thank you. Um, so I've been asked to um, use more, um, oh okay. So I'm just gonna mention that uh, I am using the terms women and men, but that does not include all genders or gender non-conforming. Yes, thank you so much for the recommendation on that. So to talk about a little bit about the root causes and thinking about preventing sexual violence, primary prevention programming provides the opportunities for us to focus. We talked about this. We can focus on root causes of sexual violence. So social norms that allow it to exist in the first place. So this really means making the connection between all forms of oppression. So you think racism, sexism, all the things listed here, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, ageism, classism, this creates this culture, whoops, excuse me, this culture where inequality really does have the chance to thrive and violence is seen as normal. So prevention, what we want to do is we want to get rid of these things. We want to change the systems and the norms so that equality, respect, and safety are the new norms. Hopefully you're seeing that coming through there in our green tree. And so this is where anti-oppression work comes in. When we're doing this work, we, we truly believe that you cannot be doing this work 
without addressing oppression. Because in order to end one form of oppression like sexual violence, you have to work to end all forms of oppression. And there are so many programs out there right now, um, more and more we hear about every day that are incorporating anti-oppression work into their programming. So um, we love to hear about this. Uh, uh, forms of oppression that we're hearing folks say they're addressing are sexism and heterosexism and racism, classism, ableism, and programs are really engaging with their communities in social justice and also anti-racism movements. We have uh, programs that are working right alongside of Black Lives Matter, the Latino and um, uh, Latina, Latinx and immigrant migrant mar farm worker rights. Um, we have a really good friend who's doing so much good work in that area and lots of people coming on board with that. Also people who are programs that are helping to address issues related to um, the historical oppression of Native American communities and also working within those communities to develop culturally relevant programs and resources. And I really like this quote. This is from the Institute of Medicine. This is something um, that sets us up for the social, to talk about the social ecological model a little bit and sort of where we do our work and why we do it. It's really unreasonable to expect that people will change their behavior easily when so many forces in the social, cultural, and physical environment conspire against such change. So you think about that tidal wave, you think about all the forces that are coming at people, um, it is really hard to expect and one individual to change their behavior. And that's where this awesome, awesome thing comes in. And this is our social ecological model. I'm sure you've probably seen this. Um, it really helps it, we use it as a framing tool for talking about primary prevention um, and as a way to look at comprehensive prevention approaches for a lot of different health issues. So if you can look at this here, we actually kind of describe it as like nested eggs. Um, and each egg represents an area in which we, which we have uh, the ability to create change. So for the individual, you're looking at a person's attitudes, their values, their beliefs, through their relationships, you're looking at um, how people interact with their family members, their partners, whoops, partners and their friends. For the community you're looking at, that's neighborhoods, schools, your faith communities, your local organizations as a community. And then in society, this is where the, uh, we look at this broader, um, this broader level of laws and systems, media, and then those widespread social norms that we've talked about before as well. So I like talking about this because what we know is that people don't live on islands just floating around all by themselves. They're not out there in, on their little individual blue island floating around. They are actually, the individual, as you can see from this example, is nested within all these other eggs, within all these other spheres of influence. So they're constantly being influenced by the people they're with, by the community they live in, by the general and the broader society that they live in. And so if we just focus on the individual, if we just say, okay, well, we're gonna help try and change their attitudes and their behaviors, but we kind of ignore these outer levels, um, we really can't provide that much change. It's that quote again about, you know, we can't expect people to, to change their minds and change their behaviors if everything else that they're living in and experiencing in the world is conspiring against that change. So we have to push ourselves. Sometimes it's not easy. I think we've really, really got down the relationship and individual pieces, but where we're pushing people right now is communities, community out level, doing some change work in the community and also society level. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. So let's do a little quiz. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, show you, give you an example of a program and you're gonna tell me where that program um, lives within the social e ecological model. So I'll, the first one, so if you want to put it in the text chat, you can do that. So okay, where do you think this activity fits? So this is the technique. A prevention group takes part in different activities to examine gender roles and to challenge their beliefs in harmful gender stereotypes. So this is a group that you're doing, it's a bunch of people sitting in a group and they're learning how to examine gender roles and challenge their personal beliefs. So where do you think that fits? Is that individual, relationship, community, or society? So we have a vote for community. 
individual community. All right, community. Well, I'm going to tell you the secret. It actually sounds like community, but it is an individual level. As you think about, oh, someone said all of them. All right, go Claudia. So this is the, actually an individual level because if you think about, about it, the activities are, are being done to influence each group member's individual attitudes, their values, and beliefs about gender stereotypes. So let's do another one. Okay, so a local, and we're not using any of them twice, so that's your first clue. A local after school program, youth program, updates their safety policies, and they also train every single staff member and volunteer on the new policies. Where does that fit? So you're thinking of after school program, safety policies, all everybody's trained, community, community. Yep, you got it, yay! You get gold stars. This is a community. I, I love okay. how like Independence House is like taking votes by hands. I <laughs> love that. that is so awesome. Good job. Good job. I'm yes. I'm sorry. I can't. I I'm so paying so much attention to all the other bells and whistles that I haven't been able to really look at people. So yay! Thanks for pointing that out, Deanna. So. This is a community level because if you look at, they're updating the school policies. So you think in, so if school is the community, they're updating the policies, that's community level work. And they're also training everyone in that community. Um, so they're training all the people at the school, the adults at the school, positively influence, or not the school, excuse me, the, it's a community center, um, to positively, no, I guess it was a school, to, uh, um, for the entire school community. So they're influencing folks at the community level. Excellent, all right. One more, or two more actually. A local sexual assault agency and their state coalition introduced legislation to require comprehensive sexual health education in statewide K through 12 schools. Yeah, I was like, I'll help y'all get this one. Society. <laughs> All right, this is society. It's a larger sex societal level technique because legislation impacts the whole, the larger society. And in this case, it would really influence sexual health education requirements um, for the schools across the state. So you're looking at um, really that broad level change that is sometimes really hard to think about and hard to imagine how that looks, but this is one way. And one more, young people in a prevention group practice ways to show friends or partners that they respect the other person's boundaries. Yay, <laughs> it's the only one left, relationship. So that it is at this level because um, the youth are learning and, and not only just learning, but practicing skills that are gonna positively influence the way that they interact with each other and their relationship. So great job, everybody. Snap, snap, says Jane Doe. <laughs> All right. Let's get to the next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, about risk reduction now and, and kind of like why that's different from primary prevention. So here's an animation. Hopefully it works. So risk reduction is really a common way that a lot of people think about preventing sexual violence. So um, if you've been, whoops, let me try this again. If you've been raised as a woman, and a young woman in society, and, and honestly, this could go across uh, gender, non-conforming gender type, whatever, uh, anyone can be plagued with these harmful messages. These are, this is not working right, sorry about that. That, um, you know, tend to focus on increasing personal safety so that you can avoid sexual assault. So maybe you've gotten that message, and I always like this one, don't, don't walk on streets that aren't well lit. Um, or you've gotten some this thing about, oh, here's a new pepper spray keychain. Okay, sorry. I'll try to do this one more time. Um, it's like, oh yeah, that's not helpful, but thank you. Um, you're probably familiar with risk reduction. If any of these messages sound familiar to you, maybe you've given them. I mean, I have, I've been like, oh yeah, you should do this. Um, Honestly, messages like this um, and are, safe, are safety messages, and they, they are actually important. So if you think about ways that we incorporate this every day, we actually give 
children's safety messages like, hey, kids, always look both ways before you cross the road. And then communities also share safety information within their community that can really be a powerful tool to increase safety in society, in a society where um, every community is, is equally prioritized and protected due to, um, due to, it's not, excuse me, so that, let me start over. Um, communities uh, share safety information within their community. It, that can be a really powerful tool to increase safety in a society where not every community is equally prioritized or protected because of racism, because of classism, because of heterosexism, because of someone's immigrant status. So we're not saying that safety messages aren't good or aren't cool. What we're saying is um, they are different from primary prevention. And if you think about prevention and risk reduction, I kind of like to put these side by side. When you're, when you're talking about prevention, you're talking about we're getting to the root causes. You're focusing on oppression. You're focusing on social norms and systems change. With risk reduction, the focus most of the time is on the potential victims or perpetrators. So what can you as an individual do? With prevention, it's behavior-based. And again, we're looking at the multiple levels. So where can we reach people, individual relationship, community, and society? What population, um, the population sort of uh, the larger population level approaches. With risk reduction, it's about stopping an assault or attempted assault. With prevention, we're looking at long-term change. We don't just want um, to change someone's attitude and then we just walk away or, or change their mind about something, we just walk away. We say, okay, well, that's good. So we change one person. Um, hopefully that lasts. We're really, we are really looking at long-term change when we're looking at um, overturning, in a way, the, the root issues um, of oppression and sh really changing the system, that's long-term change. Um, it's the, that's, why we're all, that's probably why we're all so tired all the time, right? And if you look at risk reduction, it's individual-based. So it's looking at a person's attitudes and, and their personal responsibilities. So who is responsible? Here's another great way to look at it. If it focuses on potential victims or increasing personal safety, it's risk reduction. If it is um, focusing on potential aggressors, people, perpetrators or social norms that normalize violence, that would be primary prevention. So this is a nice little, and this is, these, when these animations pop up, which is why I'm having some problems with them, um, these are all part of our online learning tool. So if you do take that, um, you'll get to see this sort of in action. And you already know all the answers, so you should actually ace the quiz if you do the online learning tool. So again, programming that challenges um, the cultural and social norms that are supportive of violence can really help us um, reduce and, pre and prevent violence from happening in the first place. A lot of programs that are doing this work are really looking at that community level. We talked about that um, a little bit, and we're gonna get into that in a second. Really looking at engaging whole communities in changing um, their norms. And another really important thing to think about when we're doing prevention programming is cultural relevance. So one thing we always say to folks uh, when we're tr providing training and technical assistance is that when you're doing prevention programming, one size does not fit all. Have any of you um, ever implemented a strategy or a curriculum in a community that really ended up not working out so great. I mean, I've done that a, a lot. In my, my pre, prior to coming here 12 years ago, I was in the local, pro, uh, doing local programming for seven years. And we would walk in with like a curriculum and we'd be like, hey, everybody, you're gonna love this. It's fantastic. There's videos and there's games and we have snacks and there's like some art. And we would walk into community centers with um, mostly youth and they would be like, get out, you're horrible. And you know, we would walk away going, oh my gosh, what did we do wrong? Um, I, we thought they'd love it. It was because we didn't really know what they wanted or needed because we, we were just kind of doing what we were told and going in with what we had. Um, when we think about, is this relevant to the community? Um, it's really, it is really, really important. What we're thinking about is, um, have you looked at the needs of your community? Have you done any type of assessment? And that can be a lot of different 
things. It could be a survey. It could be a focus group. It could be conversations. It could be stories that they share. Um, you know, we really need to be focusing on the needs of our community, finding out what those are, and really involving community members from the start in both identifying the problem, what they want to address, and also how they want to do it, the solution. So this is where comprehensive programming comes in because you can actually bring the community, you have to create awareness of the issue. Maybe people are like, never really thought about it that way. That's, there's a lot of foundational work that, that can be done when you're doing, when you're laying the groundwork for prevention. So you can bring community members together. You can talk about what sexual violence is, the impact on a community, but then don't just leave it there, continue the conversation. So an important next step would be um, getting to know the community member, taking part in different things throughout the community so that your face is there, they get to know you and who you are, and you're working with them in that community to both identify and then tailor prevention strategies that are gonna work for them. So we can't say enough about the fact that really it is not one size fits all. That's why I like this picture so well because sometimes we have these cookie cutter approaches. Like we have to use this, we have to use that curriculum, we have to do this. Um, it's not to say that you shouldn't be using um, prevention techniques that are um, that have some evidence behind them and some theory, but you can you can do that and still be meeting the needs of your community. And so um, this is a really important piece. Okay, so we have another quiz. And let's just check my time here. All right, looks like we're doing good. Um, and again, if there's any questions, please feel free to put those in. I'm just going to scroll up quick, make sure, Deanna, if I miss a question, I know you'll probably let me know, but. Um, no, you're good. Okay, great. I haven't been paying very much attention, unless it's quiz time, I haven't been paying attention to the text chat, so. Okay, so here, so I'm going to actually give you some examples of strategies that, and you can actually write in the text chat, whether it's primary prevention or risk reduction. So if you want to put PP or RR, so primary prevention, risk reduction, um, you can do that. I wish I had like little prizes I could just woo, send to you automatically, but I can't do that. Because normally in an in-person training, I would have like little things to throw out at you. I was just thinking the same thing. It would be cool if Zoom has this little like emojis <laughs> or something. So we can yeah. to people, that would have been cool. Yeah, we could recommend that. And <laughs> that. So here's your first uh, quiz question. So, a self defense class for young women in high school. Oh, this is tricky. Risk reduction. Somebody says risk reduction. Risk reduction. Risk reduction. Risk. Okay. Y'all, y'all are right. It is risk reduction because the responsibility to prevent an attack or assault is on the potential victims. Um, there are some uh, sexual, there are some, excuse me, some um, self-defense programs that actually do work from a feminist theory background, empowerment based, um, that have some good components to it, but we would recommend that you really need to do your homework if you're doing any type of um, self-defense uh, classes and then figure out how to incorporate primary prevention into that. So the nice thing about this is that anytime on this um, online learning tool, anytime you get like, oh, it's risk reduction, we actually give you a little example of how you could make it primary prevention. So this example is, um, think about ways that you could work within a high school to update their sexual harassment policies, a student bill of rights, or ways that you could work with a group of students to cultivate a school-wide climate of respect. So again, maybe the school wants you to do this. They're like, oh, this is it, or they're doing it, but you can be like, oh, hey, that's cool. And we're also going to want to come in and do this other stuff um, that's more primary prevention. So this next one is a school club working on um, improving their skills to interrupt sexist, racist, homophobic, and transphobic jokes and comments. Is that a risk reduction or primary prevention? <sighs> Y'all are so good. I'm very impressed. This is primary prevention because students are working to improve their skills and also change the social norms within the school. Yay. Bravo. 
Okay, posting flyers telling young people to get their own drinks when they go to a party and not to let the drinks out of their sight. Risk reduction or primary prevention. Oh, I know you all know this. Awesome, yes. That is risk reduction because again, responsibility to do something is on people who, who could be potential victims. If you wanna make it primary prevention, there are things you can think about, um, ways you could work with young people to help them create parties where everyone feels respected and safe and ways that they can promote those messages to their peers. There's actually some, we use these examples of like wanna make it primary prevention. These are actually examples that we have gotten from people who've implemented these things. So we had a, um, we had a campus program that was working with um, fraternities and sororities and they were like, oh my gosh, if I see one more flyer about or like poster at a frat house about um, risk reduction and how I need to watch my drink. And so they actually worked together and like um, had did a program where they uh, trained people to be like uh, to help them put parties to get other parties where um, this norm was created of like everybody here is going to be respected everybody here is going to feel safe and we have people in in the building in the building or in the house that will take you out of here and remove you if if you're making anyone feel disrespected or unsafe and so um, you know like there's lots of little ways you can do that and incorporate a more primary prevention approach Okay, here's another one. Practicing ways to ask for consent in various situations with friends and partners. Is that risk reduction or is that primary prevention? Primary prevention. Oh, somebody says risk reduction, which is cool. It's actually primary prevention. And I'll tell you why it actually, if you're looking at your of ways to ask for consent, you're building skills. Uh, this is that relationship level work. So you're building skills so that people can learn how to treat others with respect and also how to respect boundaries. Okay, and I think there's one more. Updating church policies on healthy boundaries and staff behavior expectations. Is that risk reduction or primary prevention? Mm -hmm. Most people are saying primary prevention. Yep, this is considered primary prevention. Um, because if you look at updating policies, it's going to help create um, a, a, a church community that's safer for everyone. Excellent job, everyone. And really quick, um, yeah. a question about sort of like understanding risk reduction and primary prevention. So um, a TV campaign or ad, a, TV, um, a TV ad or a billboard ad, would that be uh, risk reduction or primary prevention? I think I'm going to talk about that in about 30 seconds. Awesome. Because I'm going to talk. That's I would I would put that into the social marketing campaign um, category here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fact that a lot of people use those for primary prevention, but I think there's um, I think there's some things you need to think about if you decide to go that route. So. Um, so these are just a, so I'll get to that in one second, but these are just a few examples of programming um, that's happening all around the country that actually seeks to promote positive norms and behaviors. So the first one is engaging bystanders. So um, I think we probably, these seem to be everywhere and especially campuses because you have these captive audiences um, and you can really do some interesting change work on, on campuses. But bystander programs are really helpful because they engage community members um, in preventing sexual violence, because what they what it what the aim is is they are they are aiming to equip community members with both knowledge and skill about when and how to intervene when they see um, some potential dangerous situations or when they hear problematic language or behavior. Some people would put this into a risk reduction category if you're responding as a bystander when something's already happening. But there are lots of behaviors we talked about that that continuum of sexual violence in the beginning. There are lots of things that jokes, things that can be um, really nipped in the bud at the beginning um, to create this culture of like, no, that's not acceptable. We're not accepting that here. And as a bystander, I'm going to become involved now and I'm gonna um, tell you why. And the difference is sometimes people will have bystander programs in their communities where they're like, here's all the knowledge you need 
to go be a great bystander, but there's no practice. And so what we know about effective bystander programs is that there's a combination of here's the knowledge you need and also the skill by practicing. And so what we see is that those that are most effective are actually doing really good um, skill building with their groups. So social marketing campaigns can be really great because you can, you can do a billboard, you can do lots of things where you're challenging harmful norms by creating awareness of good norms. So sometimes it's like, don't do drugs. Well, yeah, we know that. Tell us what to do instead. So that's kind of where really good social marketing campaigns come in is where you're promoting the norms and behaviors you want to see. And a lot of these campaigns are used to market, um, like I said, market the norms you want to see and also reach a large number of, of people in your target population or your target audience. It's, but this is where I want to just make a note, and Deanna, this goes to your question. Social marketing campaigns alone don't don't really change things. They, they don't, they aren't alone, just prevention um, in and of themselves. But we always say, use them in, in conjunction with joint strategies aimed at skill building and behavior change. And that's where the real benefit is seen. So um, there, there's a school that we heard about where the, the youth actually created a social marketing campaign based on a bystander program and a healthy behaviors program they were doing in the school. They wanted to reinforce the norms and behaviors they wanted to see among their fellow students. And so the students actually um, created, they did a big poster campaign. So the school was plastered with all these awesome, great um, social marketing tools and reminders for the students who were going through the programming and learning these skills and behaviors. Um, it was like nice little reminders. So it was just amplifying um, the prevention work that was already happening. So I hope that answers your question a little bit. Um, and I know we don't have too much time left. Let me just run through a couple more things. So engaging men and boys. So with this, we're thinking of gender equity and um, positive masculinity and how those are really key to, to interrupting harmful social norms that contribute to violence. Um, so a lot of these programs are engaging men and boys in violence prevention work by using educational approaches, social media approaches to dispel myths about those. Remember we talked about those norms and sort of the uh, norms around what it takes to be a man and we it's really is looking at re-envisioning um, masculinity so coaching boys into men is one that a lot of people talk about where it's working with coaches um, there's actually a program now called um, what well, was called slay but I forget what it's called now but it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, for um, female identified youth um, working with coaches um, so that it's not just coaching boys into men now but now but it's actually looking at um, coaching um, female identified youth um, in schools um, with some of the similar practices of coaching boys into men. Um, and also thinking about youth engagement, a lot of programs are engaging youth and training them as activists in their communities, um, doing peer education with them, and really engaging youth in not just like, here's what you need to do, but helping them, again, guiding them in creating um, solutions, identifying problems and creating solutions, and um, training them with leadership skills so that they can do the, the work in their communities. Um, and then um, also promoting healthy sexuality. This is about, you know, healthy sexuality is more than just sex. It's about having this knowledge and power to express sexuality in ways that um, enrich one's lives. And so a lot of what this looks like a lot of times is that comprehensive um, sexuality education in high schools um, or in schools in general, and also um, consent education as well in community, um, community programs and schools as well. So lots of different things like this happening throughout the country. And these are just a few examples, some of those overarching um, ways that, that um, folks are trying to promote positive norms and behaviors and challenge the harmful norms out there. And I just wanna kind of leave you with this, that I've talked about a lot of things today and sort of given you a lot to think about, I hope, and it can be a little overwhelming if you're thinking about how do I do all this? How do I work against this tidal wave? Um, how do I engage my community? But um, I really just think, you know, it is a process and small changes can make a big difference. And so um, a great first step is just simply by saying prevention is a priority, primary prevention is a priority, and then mapping out a plan and celebrating successes, however small or, you know, small they might seem, but really um, thinking about those small changes and how they can add up to make a really big difference in your community. 
Um, so I, I don't know if there's time for one or two questions or if you have questions and then there's also my contact information. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have or you can email me. Yeah, they can also send, um, we could leave the chat uh, room open for another five minutes or so. I want to be mindful of everybody's time and I know that uh, we're supposed to be ending at two. So for those who may need to step out, um, that's totally fine. For those who may want to stay and ask a couple of questions, if again, you're open to it, um, we can maybe like add another five minutes for you to answer any other questions. So I'll give some time for everybody to step out for those who may want to. And for those who are still here, again, I wanna thank Jen and thank everybody for attending. I also want to kind of like put on your radar that uh, Mark Virgin Aper from the Department of Public Health and I will be doing an in-person training on November 2nd on Primary Prevention 201. You can find all that information on our member lodge, but I will send the link out just to, um, you know, just to put a reminder. This is sort of like the, the next uh, information from Jen's uh, presentation today. So please, um, would love to have you there. Again, it's Primary Prevention 201, Understanding and uh, Applying the Foundations of Primary Prevention. And that's with um, Mark Virgin Aper from the Department of Public Health and myself, and Ayana as well. And I just want to thank everybody again. My name is Diana Mancera. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and Ayana, they, them, theirs. And Jan. Hi, she, her, hers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Jen, I might just leave it for five more minutes in case That's anyone else has any other questions. That's totally fine. And for all the other ones that want to step out, they will just leave as their own leisure. Thanks. Thanks. Everybody is like, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This was really fun. Sorry about my animation snafu. <laughs> that was a good animation, though. The uh, questions were awesome, too. Yeah. It was just going a little, that one was going a little too fast, but um, it's fine. <laughs> well, and um, I wonder if you can slow down that on, do you think that you can slow down, like, how fast the... I I can. I actually uh, tested it twice and it was fine, but for some reason um, when I was here, I don't know if I was clicking wrong or something, but it just kept going too fast. I was yeah. like, I can't talk that fast. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good though. I hope it, I hope it was okay with the recording. <laughs> it looks like pretty much everybody um, left. There's a couple okay. other people, but um, if they have any questions, I either will reach out to you or um, they can send them to me or I, I will put your contact info when I send the um, survey and okay. want to hear our feedback and everybody's feedback from um, today's webinar, I can share that with you as well. We would love that because we report that um, information to CDC. Oh, somebody just wrote something. Oh, I see. Um, tips on starting primary prevention in a different community. Oh, yeah, I have actually lots of tips on that, but that probably is, um, I will just write, yes, absolutely. Um, we have, we actually just did a presentation on this. Maybe we can have you back for that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would love, to, and I'm sorry, I wish Mo, well, I know it's hard with two presenters, but like, I wish Mo was here because, um, yeah, that would be something the two of us might be able to do together too. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask them to email me. Is that okay? Oh, let me just put, I'll see if that's okay. Or I can email them. Oh, good. Oh, are you still, are you still on the call? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, they're still, okay. 
<laughs> I didn't realize this person was still on the call so they can hear me and read my email. All right, awesome, thank you. So maybe we can talk about um, future uh, collaboration then. So Absolutely. We're super interested in the work that you're doing and how you present it. So again, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, and thanks for your recommendation. I apologize about the not using the general, the gender general language. It's something that we usually do because of those, uh, the research that we use for that is so limited to the men and women. Right. We usually have a thing we say about that and I completely just whoop, didn't even do it. So thanks for saying Not big deal. It's totally fine. Thank you though. Always a learning moment. Always. Thanks. Thanks so much. I'll be in touch then. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Nice to meet you. Good to see you, Deanna. Bye. Take care. Bye. Oh, look. <gasps> Yay. Hey. You know, every time you look at that, you know how special you are. I think of you. You should bring it next year to the RP. I year. will. And be like, by the way, I got my bottle. Like, oh, what? Wait, yeah. you're just getting them now? Oh, I've had this for like a year. What are you talking about? <laughs>